<clears throat> so now we are going to hear from Maria Rivera. I'm just going to make an announcement. I'm going to take everybody's questions except Dawn's. <laughs> You're, You're making me nervous already. I haven't even started. Go in front of the screen. So you can oh, okay, in front of the screen. Sure. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm, I love this community. Um, Dawn did introduce me to the community, and I just think it's a great, a great resource for entrepreneurs. Today, I want to talk about financial literacy for entrepreneurs. A little bit about myself. Um, I've been in finance for about 20 years now. I started in banking. I uh, was in banking for about 10 years. I have a finance degree from UCF, MBA from Rollins College, um, and I have been owning my practice for nine years now. I do financial and accounting work for business owners. So what is a common problem I see when I meet with business owners? Um, entrepreneurs a lot of times think that they don't need to learn about finances just yet because they don't have any money. So for them to really understand finances and make financial decisions, their thought process is they first need to make money. So in the first couple of years of a business owner or an entrepreneur journey, they always focus on sales first, which is great, and they don't focus on financial literacy. And that can be very costly to them. Um, a lot of times they make decisions that hinder their growth and it could lead to like jeopardizing long-term success for them. Another thing is they don't understand the power of financial foresight. So if we do financial planning or we think about our business financially in the future, it's like a manifestation of profit. So they really don't understand that tool and that power of sitting down and planning what we're going to do. And it also helps them prepare for challenges that may come. So what are the costs, like the real cost of this lack of knowledge for entrepreneurs? So what I often see is a cycle that is formed. So it usually starts with unexpected financial crisis that is created. They have missed investment opportunities. And then of course, um, they hinder their growth and scalability. So as entrepreneurs, they have this energy, this reactive energy, like this hustle and bustle mentality that they're going to go out there and they're just going to make it happen. And that same energy they use to make financial decisions. So what happens is they create unexpected expenses that drains their profit. So once that happens, now they don't have money to pay for some of these expenses. So they start using their credit cards or they get a loan and they start trying to use that to pay it off. Now they've created unnecessary debt for themselves. So the unnecessary debt, the unexpected expenses now has them cash strapped. So what happens is they miss opportunities of growth because now if there is an opportunity for them to grow, they don't have money to invest in it because they have all these other expenses. So they miss those opportunities. That leads to loss of sales and then you know lead to loss of market share. So it's a pretty big, in the long run kind of cost for them. So what is the solution? So I know we talk a lot about financial literacy. My goal is to do more on point, real time financial literacy. Also proactive financial planning. That is an amazing tool that I feel like entrepreneurs do not take advantage of. And of course, understanding the different apps and tools that are out there that they can use. Now, financial literacy, we can get on TikTok, we can get on Facebook, we can get on, and we're gonna hear all these things of what you should do. But I think that's the worst way to provide financial literacy to entrepreneurs. Like, they're so overwhelmed already, they're trying to make a business happen. So when they hear all this information, they don't really know how to apply it. And it kind of goes through one year and comes out through the other, and it's not, if, it doesn't really make any difference for them. So my goal is, I, I think on point or real time financial literacy is really important to them. Um, financial planning. A lot of times they're like, oh, you know, I don't have money to, what are we planning for? Like, I don't have any money. I have to go first and make the money and then we can plan. But financial planning is more of a tool of teaching them. 
So like you have this business, what are you going to be doing in the next month? What are your expenses? How are you going to get your money? And then, you know, as we go through those conversations, they start asking questions and that's a great place to coach them. And then of course, there's so many tools. The tools are great, but they don't need them all. And I think they also need to be taught how to use the tools because they start using the tool. They may not need all the features of this tool. They just may need a part of it. And then they also start like jumping from one tool to another because an entrepreneur colleague said, use this one and then use that one. And then they end up not using either. So teaching them some basic, introducing them some basic apps, tools that they can start using from the beginning is a great point to start. Now, how am I gonna enforce this solution? So, you know, it's really hard to provide CFO or financial advising services to entrepreneurs because, again, they're strapped for money, but they do need the assistance and guidance. So I was thinking of offering like a 5,500 package. Um, it's like a year accessibility to me. And the way they could do this or to my, to my team is we can do a 45 minute initial consultation where I basically get an idea of where they are financially, what are their struggles, and it's also an opportunity for them to dump their information on me and see what really applies to them and what doesn't. I was also gonna offer a quarterly meet with them where we can either review past decisions they've made and what worked or not, or plan for future decisions, whether it's three months, one month, a year, just to use that financial planning tool. And then, you know, of course, it's hard for them to meet once, a, you know, once every three months to talk or get advice. So I was thinking of having an ongoing like community or chat or group chat where when they sign up with me, they get into the group, they can ask questions in real time and we can um, work on that. I'm so sorry. I didn't do the setting that you said, sorry. So, um, so it's more of an ongoing relationship so they don't have to wait and we could do it through Voxer, which is another app that can be used. So that's pretty much my presentation. I think I did six minutes. <laughs> I was practicing, I, I cut out of all of information. That's my information there, that's my email, my website. Um, if you guys wanna get my information and jot it down, and um, if you guys have any questions, I'm open to it. Part of the uh, first question, have you considered doing, uh, I know coaches who do like monthly group meetings, and maybe it's hard if you're clients are all over the country, but uh, it's a time for several of them to get together, talk to you, but maybe they can also help each other. No, I haven't, but yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I, the only thing I came up with, like I've done, um, is the group chat. I mean, the Facebook, obviously. I thought that would be a great place, and. I can arrange like a meeting in there with them, but yeah. Okay, good. Question. Hi, yeah. Interesting presentation, thank you. Oh, thank you. I was wondering, um, yeah, first of all, I need to say that I felt so literate after your presentation, <laughs> financially literate. But my question is, um, the cryptocurrency does it hold into your field? Um, it does not. But um, so, so a lot of people ask me, like, who's your market? Like, who's your clientele? <laughs> And it's since I've been doing this, I really haven't focused like on the market. I just focus on startups and entrepreneurs. Um, you know, my background is in financial services. So in banking, we didn't have an industry. Like everybody would just come and see us and we would provide service. So I'm kind of from that mindset, that number one. And number two, I feel like the beginning stages of any business are pretty similar. You know, obviously the industry is gonna make a big impact but we're talking about basic financial literacy to start off your business. Um, and then, you know, we can partner with different, I, I have in the past partnered with different um, professionals that can specialize in certain fields. So. Yes. I have some feedback. So, uh, <laughs> so first of all, um, I love your explanations. I, I echo what, what uh, Craig was saying, it's just like, the way you explain it is very easily understood and, uh, and, and appreciated. The, 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 the things that I would ask you and encourage you to improve upon, which, and I'll, we'll go over this next week when, yes. when we meet, but uh, you need to come up with an elevator pitch. 
Right. Okay. And an elevator pitch is not a 30 second thing. I don't, we don't live in the Burj Dubai. Okay. We've got five, 10, 12 seconds max. Okay. And so we need to work on that. The, your slides had too many words. Okay. So what you do is a slide is just a background to bolster what you are talking about. Okay. So when you give a presentation, people need to be looking at you and listening to you and just using a slide to right. enhance what you're trying to say. So so you don't need to have all those words up there, you just say them. Okay. And it shortens them too. <laughs> uh, and then so more use of graphics. Um, the and then the, the your value, your your package, right? Needs to be focused on value. Okay. Okay. It's, it was focused on features. Okay. Maybe not so many yes. benefits. Yes, I do that. Right. Yes. But people don't pay for features and benefits. They pay for the value that you're right. providing them. So I would focus more on the value, like peace of mind, and you know, not being in debt, and to, yeah. well, all right. those things. Right. Okay. So that that's that's my two and a half cents. Thanks, Rupert. <laughs> Um, so Robert rebrand this as a fractional CFO because you don't have to explain what it is. If you say fractional CFO, you really know what it is. Charge monthly, you have uh, as a yearly cash flow be a lot easier. And also automate the billing so the money just falls into your account without you having to chase the money. Yeah. And then every single month, call it 300 bucks. So we're going to need two hours or an hour a month. Right. And then now you don't have a cash flow crunch ever again. Yep. You'll get 20 of those. What is that? 20 <laughs> It's a lot easier to deal with uh, that kind of ups and downs of yeah. business. You don't have to constantly sell five grand a lot of money for most businesses. Three hundred bucks a month. It's not. Yeah. Well, you know, oh, I, you know, I've been doing the reason I'm presenting too is because I've been doing this and trying to offer it. And you're absolutely right. You know, like more consistent building and getting them to do that. But the the struggle I've had is when I do like the monthly and I do hourly. It's like, I don't feel like they get the value because they're more focused on what they're paying me and how much time they're gonna get out of it. And then we'll start on a topic and then it's like, we don't get through the whole topic. And, and then I'm, I end up chasing them because now I am chasing them to be like, hey, listen, you, you know what happened? So I don't know, you're absolutely right. That's great feedback. I am, I thought, for my, I thought at one point I said, well, what I can do is fractional CFO work that's another thing. When I start saying I'm a CFO, I do fraction. They were like, "What? I can't afford you. I can't. You know, we can't. I can't afford you." Like, no. So they would. They, they immediately would shut down. Or I would get people to be like, "What is the CFO? What do they? What do they do? Oh, we're an accountant. Oh, okay, you're an accountant. No, no, we're not an accountant." So, so those are the struggles I've encountered during during that. But I I agree with you. I I, I figure if I can find that. Do you want people? They don't know the CFO. They should probably the wrong way. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. As a business coach, I see some of the things you're talking about there. And my first question is always, uh, know your cost before you put a price on something. Because okay. most of them just do what they do. They don't even think about it. And they, they're going under. Right. The suggestion I have is you have $5,500. Yeah, I know. Divided into 12 payments. Yes, correct. Because if well, they're new, they're not going to have the 55 most right. likely. But if you break it into smaller payments, mm -hmm. you can do. The first question I usually ask them is, uh, let me see your P&L, and they'll say, what's a P&L? Yes, <laughs> yeah. So I always say the first thing you want to do is get an accountant. Okay. CPA, accountant, or CFO. Yeah. Okay. That's a good presentation. Thank, thank, you, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I thought it was a great presentation, very easy to follow, and uh, I myself felt very financially illiterate I here know. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so you very effective in that regard. But there's one thing I'd like to try to see that you have a great opportunity to tell us a cautionary story okay. of somebody who has gone through and got themselves yeah. established, but then they enter into one of those barriers and yeah. give any particular instance and then say, well, if you had gone to that, yeah. then they would be able to understand. So give them a more contextual story okay. example. Okay, I have tons of those, but yes. I can so, do better at marketing myself. Go ahead. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's so, been answered, yeah. So just a little bit of clarity from uh, from the presentation perspective, because like you said, a lot of them don't, a lot of a lot of startups don't know exactly what they need, and they'll maybe be talking to a few accountants, but maybe the accountant's not right for them, or Correct. even a financial advisor to set them up with like a uh, owner K or something along those lines. So are you 
primarily consulting them on what their options are and then providing direction to, uh, to accomplish those goals or are you actually fulfilling the need <laughs> as it comes open? Um, so, so I started off just wanting to put a financial plan, a personalized financial plan for each entrepreneur. So a lot of that has to do also with their personal goals. So we, we would sit down and kind of figure out, like, what, what are you trying to do with this business? Like, what is your end goal here? You know, I, I, we know it's to make money, but more than that, what, what are you going to do with this money? Like, what, are you just going to make money? You're going to make money? Oh, no, I'm going to make money because I want to buy a house, or I want to invest here, or I want to expand. So kind of going down that route with them and understanding can help me start planning with them what's important that they need to focus on. And yes, I do provide the solution more than just the coaching. Actually, I've been providing the solution and not so much the coaching. And um, and I feel like I have to do like a combination of two where I can coach and provide the solution. Now that creates a couple of terminal issues for my business, right? Because now I'm like on the two path, but I, I feel like if I can streamline that and um, get an extra support, I could do that. I don't know if that answered. So you license as an advisory? I do, I, I don't do, um, like investment advisor, like 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 what we call FAs. Financial, financial yeah, financial. We don't do that. This is all business driven. So we do kind of focus a little bit on the personal because that's like the end result. But the business is going to drive those personal goals. So really quickly, the reason I started this was I was in banking. I was doing financial advising. So I was advising on retirement accounts and all these things. And my my group was entrepreneurs. They had money but they never knew what the money was for. Like it was like, oh, I need it there for an emergency or this is something's coming up. So that's where I was like, maybe they need assistance in planning their financials so they can invest in these things. So all right, that's a little bit where it all came from. Josh. So I, thank you for sharing. And I pretty much second everyone's advice on <clears throat> the feedback for the presentation. Uh, so features are good, benefits are great, but the mission is magical. So what is the bigger reason? The one thing I didn't hear is why you? Why do you care so much and why are you the right person for this? Because there's thousands yes, there is. of CFOs, thousands of people doing this, probably in Rollins alone. Yep, correct. Why are you so different? And that's got to come out in your presentation. Okay. So if you want to share that now and then make sure you include sure. that next time. Um, because the reason I'm different is, first of all, I, I, I am an entrepreneur. I'm a small business person myself. So I've been behind the scene and in front of the scene. So I've been advising when I did it, like financially, when the bank, and then I've also been in the process. And the main reason why is a lot of times when it comes to finances, you know, they've, I, my background's in finance, I went to wrong. So everything's very structured and they, they present things like A, if you do A and you do B, you get C. And a lot of times you don't, you know you have to do A and B, but you don't do them because of other issues. So I feel like the, the conscious part of financial planning is not there. And I think that creates a lot of anxiety for entrepreneurs because now they're like, if I'm gonna go with you, I have to succeed. Like I have to make sure that I do the right things and oh my God, I didn't do that. And I think um, finances and financial planning is a journey and it's a process. And I feel like the human side of it sometimes is taken out and it's more like, let's go make money. We gotta make money, we gotta do, make the right choices. And that's not reality, especially when you're an entrepreneur. Like you're an entrepreneur, you, you have to, you focus on your family, you focus on your business. Things get blended. It's no longer just the business. Now it's the business and the personal. And you need to make money because now you need to feed your kids. And so it becomes a little complicated at the beginning of the journey. And I think that it puts a lot of pressure on the entrepreneur that they have to do it right. And I feel like you are doing it right. Like whatever decision you make, whether it's a good one or a bad one, you know, that's the decision and we're gonna take that and move on to the next one or go from there. So so I don't know. Some some more consciousness in here is what I'm I bring to the table, I guess. All right, I'm sorry, we're out of time. I know you had a question. I know. <laughs> it was probably the best question ever. Sorry. Real quick. Real quick. Real, Real quick. quick. Um I was just gonna say, as, as a startup guy myself, um, sometimes I'm willing to pay for access to you as like a consultant. Other times I feel like I need to buy a product. And so for me at marketing, I'm always putting things into products. And so it might be nice for you to have an option where you're buying like a module or a program. So if you're a pre-launch startup, you haven't done funding, 
I've got a three month program and it's called the pre-launch financial program, right? And then, so if you meet somebody else and they're in year two and they're trying to figure out how to scale. Oh, I've got module two is how to scale a business. And it's a three month program, it has a cost. <laughs> you know, it starts with you fill out these forms, then we meet on the forms and I give you the action plan. So for me, it's easy for me to buy things that I can kind of put into packages. Right. Correct. Other people are like, I really need a consultant and I want access to you for the whole year. Okay. So final question is, what can we as a community do for you? Uh, you know, all of that stuff. <laughs> help with all that suggestions. <laughs> um, no, yeah, just continue to help, you know, providing for, you know, platforms like this so I can get educated and access to amazing coaches that can help me put all this together and networking and exposure. All right. That Great. Thank you very much. Oh, can I, can I get in here? I've been here five times, right, Don? Sure. Don, say yes. As far as I know, that's true. <laughs> You get one for presenting. I know, right? Maria, don't forget, this is being taped. So once it's on, online or on YouTube, you can watch it and study it. Perfect. And, you know, go over all the questions and the feedback. Right. Thank you. This is 2023, it's being captured. <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing it, it's being taped. That's, it's called a skewomorph. A skeuomorph, S K E U O morph, is is a little symbol that we use, or the word that we use that uh, for technology that no longer exists. We still dial our phones, and Scott is still taping something, and we still use that kind of word. Or if you look on some apps and, and programs, the save button. Anybody know what it is? The floppy disk. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody still own a floppy disk? But we use that. That is a skewomorph. So, so anyway, we are going to hear from William Glass, who is who comes to us uh, from New York by way of Alabama. Uh, and he's, uh, he's one of Sean's mentees, and he's going to talk to us about ostrich. William. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Excited to be here. And uh, sorry, I can't join you all in person today. Um, I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich. And we have a financial wellness solution for college students that rewards them for making smart financial choices now uh, rather than waiting. Um, and the reason why I care about what we do so much, getting straight to the mission for Josh, uh, is that uh, <laughs> is that um, growing up, I had multiple members of my family that filed bankruptcy, parents' relationship in part fell apart due to finances and just saw how not getting this stuff right early on impacts every other area of our life. Um, and so there's things that you can do when you're young that help set yourself up for success. And so that's ultimately what we do um, because it's really hard to get ahead financially. And these are actual stats from the students that we've worked with. 80% um, don't know their credit score, 95% don't have an emergency fund, and about 70% aren't investing. Um, and so there's core things that you can do when you're young that will help set yourself up for success. And that's what we focus on. And we measure ourselves in terms of our impact on these three areas. Um, the way that the app works is when you download it, you get your financial health score, which shows you where you are today, how you compare to your peers, and then has simple steps that you can do to improve. And it also talks about what those things are as you go. And then there's ongoing challenges to help build those habits. Um, one of the key things is that this is really for people that are just starting out. We don't care about dollar amounts. It's more about the behaviors at this point in time, um, given our demographic. Um, my background, uh, Andrew and I are both Rollins College uh, graduates. We actually won the venture plan competition back in 2022. Um, and we actually had previously gone through it in 2021, made the semifinals, but didn't and uh, and came back the next year as we'd made more progress. Um, uh, we're both former student athletes. Did we lose you? Athletes in a key demographic for Oh, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, said connection was unstable. Um, and yeah, so my background's in B2B sales. Um, Andrew has a background in finance and we've known each other since uh, freshman year of college in 2010, where we played soccer at Rollins. And we've got a great team of advisors. And I know Dr. Sean wants to say a, a couple words at the end. Um, our go-to-market is focusing on uh, two things. One, working with universities. So doing your traditional like B2B sales um, and our focus is athletic departments because of those NIL regulations where financial literacy is um, required. 
And then the second is we do events with student groups, mostly Greek life. So we'll go into fraternities and sororities and we'll do events where we introduce um, ostrich. They run like a trivia night, just like you would do at a bar. Um, we bring in prizes and all kinds of stuff and they're a lot of fun. And that's how we onboard people. And we actually drive revenue off those events as well. Um, it's free for the school, but I'll talk about how that works. Um, the three revenue streams, app subscription. So we're working towards this $60 number. We're not actually there yet. Each school, we've signed two schools and have a third one that will hopefully be coming on in the next couple of days. I've kind of like increased our price as we go. Um, the event sponsorship. So this is a new revenue stream that we're working on uh, is actually having wellness companies that want to reach college students through the direct to consumer events that we're doing with Greek Life. And then the affiliate revenue is how much we're actually driving um, off of each attendee for those direct to consumer events. So we're driving $17 in revenue. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got like 14 uh, partners. These are just people that are giving us products as well as some affiliate relationships with like Chime and Acorns. We've got two paid universities. Hopefully we'll have a third one on here shortly. We have about 12,000 users on the app um, and our conversion rate for those uh, events are about 40%. And these are some of the schools that we um, currently work with or have done events at. Um, yeah, so I guess when you think about like the future vision, what we're focused on now is just nailing the distribution network. We've learned that the app works really well in a B2B setting. It's not quite as sticky from a retention perspective as we'd like on the direct-to-consumer side. Um, and we just don't have the resources right now to make it as sticky as it needs to be. Um, so we're focusing on that B2B with the app and then doing these events. Um, and as we kind of build out that distribution network, we're doing it profitably. Um, and then the long-term vision is to ultimately introduce self-driving money. So we had a big philosophy early on in our uh, business that we weren't going to provide financial services. And as we spent more time in here, there's just some, there's a couple good products, but there's nothing that's great. Um, and as we actually spend time with college students, we're seeing what's missing. Um, and ultimately we'd like to build that. But until we have the distribution network, it doesn't make sense to do that just based on how the fintech space works and how hard it is to acquire customers. Um, the ask is seeking introductions into college and university administrators, particularly in athletics, career services, or student success. And then if you know any wellness brands who serve the college market, we're able to do these sample um, sampling events where we get products in their hands, capture content, um, and then are able to, uh, to help get their brands out there. So we're looking for those introductions. And I'll open it up for questions and give Dr. Sean uh, a minute because I think he wanted to say a couple words. Thank you, William. Fantastic. I met William two years ago, and when I met him, I realized this is the best thing to do. He's working on it, doing good. There are so many people are suffering, and he's a, he suffered himself and his family, and that's what is his own problem. He started working on it. He has an amazing team, teammate, and William, and he's starting the right way. He's doing it right thing for all the startups to do is putting a business model, uh, optimizing the business model to make sure that it's repeatable, scalable, and potential for profitable, profitable growth. That's what he's working on. He pivoted already several times. That's what he should be doing. So I think it's a great example. That's why I asked him to come and um, <coughs> make a presentation. He is, a, he is by the way, um, he has a podcast also. He has another hobby. He is a silicon. It's called Silicon Alley from Tri-State area. You may want to listen to that. Thank you very much, William. Okay, so I'm going to let everybody know in here that William here, we're going to need to speak up very, very loudly because he is picking up on the microphone that is sitting there on the podium. So uh, make sure that if you're talking, if you talk into the microphone, speak very, very loudly so that William can hear. Right here, hey. Josh. Oh, Josh. Thanks, William. Uh, great presentation. Uh, kudos on the 40% conversion rate at events. That's, that's actually pretty decent. Uh, but my question is more, uh, this is a very crowded space. There's so many apps that are doing something that feel like it's doing something similar. Where do you, where do you play uniquely? Like, so on maybe on an XY chart, you know, what are the two, places you think you shine that separates you from every other financial app out there? 
Yeah, our key thing is outcomes. So like financial literacy doesn't change behavior. There's plenty of research that shows that it only changes behavior 0.1%. And it's because it's not usually real time and actionable. So the key thing that we measure is that conversion number that's actually really important because we tie those to those kind of three metrics of building credit, saving and investing. Um, and so that's the key thing that we differentiate on is that we're actually driving outcomes. And then we're also measuring and reporting that back to the schools that we work with and the student organizations. So they can actually show, hey, we brought in, a, instead of just bringing in any speaker or any other app that talks about X, Y, and Z, we're actually showing that we are having an impact. And that's how we measure success on our end. So even when we do events, that conversion is really important because we're actually having people take actions that are good for them. Um, so that's kind of the, the key thing for us is, is those outcomes and then the data to show, hey, here's, here's actual impact. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I was still, uh, I was thinking for an entire presentation where you guys lose it and still couldn't find it. How does the app work? Yeah, so the app is, yeah, the app's super simple. Oh, sorry. What is the problem and what is the solve? Yeah, so the app, um, yeah, so the way that the app works is when you download it, you get your financial health score. So the first thing is like we're most people don't know necessarily where they are, especially the college kids. They don't know what they need to be doing um, besides at a high level, like should be saving or budgeting. But they don't have most of them don't have, you know, full time jobs. Right. So there's a big misconception around what they can actually be doing. And like, can, is there anything that I can do before I graduate? Um, and so that's sort of what the app does is we help solve that problem of like. I know that I should be doing something or there might be things that I could be doing. Um, and we actually show them, here's things that you can do while you're in school that you don't have to have a full-time job to be able to accomplish. So that's ultimately what the app does. And then we're helping build the behaviors more than anything. So it's about like starting to save, starting to invest, even if it's just $5 a month, because that ultimately will lead to when you do have a larger income, you'll be able to increase that and you'll already have that habit built. So that's what we focus on with the app is first helping them understand where they are today, what's the simple things they can do to improve, and then building uh, the longer term habits. Thanks for your presentation. Hopefully you can hear this too. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. I really liked how you started with the story. Thanks for that. Uh, this is an idea that you may or may want to consider at some point in the future. I know a lot of states Florida, I believe, is one of them require students in high school to take a financial literacy class prior to graduation. And I wonder if there's a way to get in with the government and your app and use taxpayer dollars to fund each high school graduate to get your app. Um, because uh, I think only 30% of high school graduates go to college, that would certainly expand your possible market. Yeah, absolutely love that. Um, it's definitely something that has come up and we've we've thought about. Um, and we'd love to we'd love to get there. We just haven't we, <laughs> there's only so much time today. Um, so if anybody does have any connections there, that would be great. And then the other thing again that we just have to be cognizant of, and I'm not sure maybe you have some thoughts on this, is like our measurement is outcomes. And if you're under the age of 18, now we need parent involvement to drive people to like open up savings, like custodial, like there's only certain, certain so many things you can do when you're not 18. Um, so that's just something that we haven't quite solved for yet either. It sounds like your the business model, two questions. Um, so the first question, it sounds like the business model that these institutions will pay per student. Um, how long does that last? How long does that scale? Uh, and then the second question is, you alluded to that you're having kind of retention problems, which I can imagine is going to be difficult here. What are your plans to keep engagement and retention after, after the initial open down? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on the school side, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lot of schools out there um, and opportunity. So our vision is that we are plugged into every single orientation and we hit every college student as they come in freshman year. Like that would that's the vision. If we can do that, we're set. Obviously, you know, that's a that's a big hurdle, um, but that's where we'd like to be. So we're just a part of the college experience. Um, when it comes to retention uh, on the B2B setting, we have good retention. It's more of that just direct to consumer. So we have the app. You guys can all go download it now if you want to. Um, but it, the cohort base is really important. 
And we tend to do like challenges that are seven days or 30 days, and those are effective. So through the actual experience um, of whatever we, whatever we queue it up as, whether it's a seven day challenge, a 30 day challenge, we have strong retention. It's after that. Um, and so we're looking at introducing more content. And then ultimately, if we're providing financial services, when you actually have a financial services product and we're that 40% conversion is for other products that are good for students. So we're converting high. The retention rate is like above is like high 80s in terms of financial services if you can get someone to sign up for it. So ultimately, if we're providing that where it's automated, somebody has a college student has one hundred dollars, that's it that they're able to put in. We direct it to the right places. A portion goes into savings, a portion, small portion goes into investing into low cost index funds. It's all automated. We believe that will be really super sticky just based on how how every other product in the space is done once you're able to actually get over the conversion challenge. So that's how we're thinking about it today, but definitely again, open, <laughs> appreciate any thoughts or feedback. So, so one thing I was thinking about for feedback regarding the stickiness factor is it, it, making it more gamified where, as you said, you have challenges, but you should be able to find sponsors based on the demographic that you're hitting to essentially reward the clients. Uh, so for instance, if uh, they're, if they get to a point of financial literacy for a doing X, Y, Z over the month, over a span of a, a week or a month or whatnot, maybe some, you know, financial institution would sponsor them to give them a credit to opening up a high yield savings account or even a brokerage account. Um, and even, you know, you have these other apps that are on things that are essentially providing affiliate rewards for referring friends over, um, not to kick back on the colleges, but you're probably going to have a better solution working in affiliate structure with the students versus trying to get faculty to educate on the financial path. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, definitely agree with that. And like, even the, I mentioned the direct, because we essentially do the exact same thing when we work with schools, the trivia events, it's a great learning tool and educational tool. We just take out the conversion piece there and focus more on what the school wants. Um, so those work really is, is effective in terms of onboarding people. And I think one of the things that you hit on with the rewards is, is great. Everybody does cash rewards, but what we found is that students care more about a Chick-fil-A gift card, or they care more about like something that they'll actually be able to use like right then and there. And we found that works way better than cash and cash rewards for whatever reason. So we'd like to, it's not incorporated in the app. It's incorporated in like the event experiences that we do. Um, but I'd like to get that in the app to your point, because I think the rewards will be really helpful. Eugene, um, how do you keep your audience engaged and uh, an incentive to use your application on a daily basis? Do you think of what they start their day from? Like, do they open your app in the morning? And uh, what's the, how do you measure frequency? Uh, like frequency. So we, we're using, like we use, um, we use SMS a lot as a way to engage the audience. So we've kind of skipped even the push, well, we have push notifications that are in the app as well, but we use, we find that college students like SMS is a lot better. So from an engagement perspective, when we're doing a daily challenge, they get a daily text with, here's the thing that you need to accomplish today. Um, and what we're looking to do right now is actually roll out more just like tips and content that's super relevant, super hyper, hyper targeted. So we haven't done a great job of that to date, um, but that's what we use is we find SMS. And I, hopefully that was your question. I was a little hard to, to hear you on that one, but I, th I think it was about retention and engagement. Yes. Bob and Josh. Uh, why the name Ostrich? And is there a little tag that, that describes it? Yeah. So, well, with Ostrich, we're helping people pull their heads out of the sand when it comes to money and finances, build a large nest egg. And if you see an ostrich or an ostrich egg in a dream, it means that you're going to hit a really important goal. Um, so that's why ostrich. Um, and uh, and yeah, and then we chose the color purple because it's, you know, from like Roman times, right? Indigo is a really hard color to get. So it represents like that affluence and royalty. And ultimately, that's where we want people to get to in their lives. You bring up a really good point uh, that people will do more for a plastic trophy uh, and the recognition of that than they will for even a thousand dollars. So seen that many, many times. Um, you have something really cool on your website, the Million Dollar Nest Egg Program. Have you thought about gamifying that and have kind of like with the um, high school or college kids, a race to a million? Kind of make that 
a game in itself where there's levels, there's rewards along the way, but the idea is it gets that million dollars. Now, granted, you can't really retire on a million dollars anymore. That's kind of the poverty line even today. Yep. <laughs> uh, but still kind of a cool thing to shoot for. And that might help people stick. That might help people because they're just gonna be going, you know, whether it's 200 bucks a month they put away or anything like that, it's gonna kind of drive them to reach that longer term goal and do all those smaller steps along the way, which is what you want, because then they gotta stay with your app. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, we've targeted that one kind of at parents because uh, there's like small amounts that you can do that have a big impact. Um, but yeah, I like I like that a lot. I think that's a, a great idea. Do you have like a parent mode where kid can be using the app and their parent can kind of help them? Maybe not see how much money they've got, um, but to at least do reminders, make contributions themselves, different things like that. Uh, we don't have that currently. You can join a challenge with someone else. So you can kind of see, like you can't see exact dollar amounts, but you can at least be in a challenge together. Um, but we don't have a way to like, we don't really have that cross communication in the app. Um, partly because of, we have some concerns around like just moderating that to make sure that there's not bad actors. Um, but you know, parent mode where it's just one, someone that you kind of opt into would probably make a lot of sense, but we don't have that currently. We have one more question. A great product uh, great presentation. Um, as a parent, it's funny, I, I think of the same thing. I just put a kid through University of Florida finance major who bounced his checkbook every month. And so <laughs> these are very lofty goals, the credit score and learn to invest in these things. And he was actually investing and learning these things early, but didn't have the basic fundamental of how much money is in my checking. Can I use my debit card? And so as a daily activity or a monthly activity, I know it's a, it's a big product lift as far as the development, but I certainly see that as just balancing, just knowing how much I have and how much I've spent on a running basis just to get through, you know, get through the month. Um, is basic financial literacy that, that he's lacking. He's out of law school and still doesn't know. I mean, you know, it's like really a kid, he could he could start a business, but doesn't know how much money I need to send him. So, and that involves the parents a little bit, but yeah, make it make it on their own. Hey, parents, if he could show me his budget, I'd be happy to send him money. Yeah. It's a big problem. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and we've like, there's a couple things that we've heard, and I maybe you got some thoughts on this, but like a lot of times, just like the way that people that college students do, the ones that are a little bit more switched on, it sounds like he's a, a little bit more uh, not as focused on it, but um like daily reminders, like people will check just to make sure they know what their balance is. So there's some like simple like notification things that we've thought about on that front. And then um, like the concept of like self-driving of like, here's how much you have to spend. And if it's, we've already taken out the small portion that's going to go to savings based on a budget. And like, we sort of build in just the 50, 30, 20 budget rule to start with as a basic one. And then you can adjust, like, that's how we're thinking about where we'd like to go with the product. Um, so then it's like the number that we show is how much is in the checking that you're allowed to spend versus, you know, here's your total account balance. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it is a, it's definitely a, a problem. Um, and we're starting to think through and try to listen to figure out what it is that will actually help solve that. Do you offer a, some sort of a graphic, for example, that a, if, the money that you have in your account and something that you would see on the home screen for them, that if the money you have in your account, you keep it there and it earns 10% a year, by the time you're 65, this is how much it will be worth. Is that something that you've thought about or that you implement so that people, because I think that would help with sticking us because then they would basically see, oh, wow, I, I, I have $200,000 or, or whatever by the time I turn 65 if I don't do anything except you know, what we're doing now. Yeah, I love that. We we don't have that today. We've we've um like stuck to more the habit side is what the app is. So we're not actually linking into a numbers or accounts right now. So that's not something that we currently have. It's more just here's a challenge. You pick how much you want to save or invest, and then we kind of track that. Um, just because there were some challenges around like linking bank accounts, and that was a big drop off in terms of of uh, of people converting and. It was just a step that lost a lot of folks because some people just don't know their bank login details, even if they want to. Um, well, but I think that's your point. Is important. This is a simple algorithm that you can just apply on your own. 
and you don't need to do any of that other stuff. Yeah, it's a good point. We just, yeah, here's the number. Here's how much you need. I know we we talk about some of that stuff at events of like, if you're 19, here's how much money you need to invest per month in order to have a million dollars by the time you're 65. And we do it that way, but it's not in the app currently. All right. And then the final question, I know you already told us, but I've never not asked it. Uh, what else can we as a community do for you? Yeah. I mean, I love all the feedback. So if you've got any other other thoughts there, that would be great. But ultimately, we're looking for more introductions at the moment into colleges and universities. So again, it's um, athletic departments, uh, career services, student success tend to be the right roles on the admin side. And then if you know any wellness brands that are trying to get in front of college students, you know, we're doing events weekly all across the US. So um, we're looking for some more from some more partners on that front. And we're really skewing towards wellness focused um, and making it well themed. All right. Well, thank you very much, William Black. All right. Where are we? Uh, we do have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Scott, would you like to shout and tell us, or come down and use a microphone and tell us what are we looking at here? All right. A um, couple of things that are coming up uh, here in a couple of weeks. Global Week which is uh, put on by um, you know, the tech community and Synapse, a uh, big thing happening uh, downtown at the Dr. Phillips Center and taking over a lot of downtown. Uh, on the, I guess a Thursday night, um, yeah. Thursday night there's a VIP party at Church Street and um, there are 39 for general admission and 59 for VIP tickets. And with this code, you get 15% off of that if you'd like to go. Be a cool networking thing and lots of libations and fun. Uh, so that's that's happening. If you want any more information about Global Week, you can ask me, and I'll tell you what I can. I know some things. And let's go. Oh, oh and Lost Frequencies is a DJ who, if you're into DJs and music at this time of the world, he's a big deal. <laughs> It's also a statement on hearing loss. <laughs> and uh, PodFest happening in January. Um, if you go to uh, this, use this QR code, or if you go to PodFest, uh, podfest.com or podfest.org, I forget. Um, but uh, you put in the code PodFest99, you get your $99 general admission expo ticket for free or you get $99 off any of the other tickets. But uh, that's the way to do that. So um, I promised last week that I would have this, and there you go, promise fulfilled. Just for knowing Scott, you get in for free. Just for knowing Scott. That's right. All right, Rupert, you had something. Thank you, Scott. So the third Monday of every month, we have our Orlando Preneur event. It's our startup happy hour. We started in January, we have over 1,300 members, and we're averaging about 120 or 130 people per event. These are startup founders, entrepreneurs, professional service providers. Uh, we have sponsors in the room. We have, uh, quite, who here is a member of Orlando Preneur? Okay, so you get an idea. And so this month's event is gonna be in conjunction with the Web3 CFL community. Uh, and it's the night before, coincidentally, Meta Center Global Week starts. Our event is going to be at the, the fantastic OptiView 360 Light Museum in Longwood. And trust me, when you go there, you will never forget it. And so our event starts at 5.30 to 8, and uh, we're looking forward to having all of you there. And it's free, and I buy the first drink. All right. That was actually going to be my next question. Rupert, does it cost anything to go? Dan, you got something? Right. Unlike Rupert's event, which is very popular, my little class <laughs> <laughs> and leadership is once a month, and it's today at 11.30 at the UCF Incubator on Colonial. So Where after we finish, used to meet. Huh? Where we used to meet. Yeah, yeah, where we used to meet. So after you finish networking here at 10.30, if you head over there, it starts at 11.30. It's one hour. And ethics is not a very popular topic, but it will help your company survive, whether you're about to start up or whether you're already working. So 
I'm so Dan. Thanks for listening, and it's free today. Thank you, Thank you Dan. <laughs> we are so oh, sorry. We are still looking for speakers. So if you would like to give a presentation next week, uh, just like William and Maria did, uh, one million cups.com slash Orlando. Click the present button at the top of the screen. Talk to Josh uh, and say, hey, I need to fast track this, and we will get you on the schedule for next week because I start promoting. Uh, each week's event basically Wednesday afternoon, and I like to say we've got speakers, so we might miss you today or even tomorrow, but Friday and through the weekend, uh, we can say, you know, hey, William's going to talk about Crackham, which he did a couple weeks ago, but, you know, William's going to talk about Crackham, you know, be, make sure you be here. So that helps bring a lot of people in as well, because they know we got some cool speakers. So uh, download the chat. Maria, uh, see me about the chat, because William had a good uh, statement about cohorts, uh, and like, like I had suggested... Uh, with cohorts. So uh, come to my computer after this. Uh, join us on meetup.com if you have not already. Meetup.com slash one million cups Orlando. Each word is hyphenated. Uh, and then uh, make sure that you connect with somebody here today. I'm sure you met somebody new or at least spotted somebody across the room that you would like to talk to. Please meet with them. Find time to have a phone call or a Zoom call, lunch or coffee. Get to know one another and let's build a strong community of entrepreneurs. So uh, don't forget your parking pass. It is out on the coffee station. And thank you very much. I will see you all in 167 hours. Have a good week.